I went to a restaurant the other day, and it was hilarious. They didn't serve water. They were like, and said on the menu, because of the drought, we're not serving water. But the menu was full of beef options. This is Ethan Brown, CEO and founder of Beyond Meat, a California-based food company. Do you have any numbers as far as like how much water is used for beef? It's anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 gallons, depending on what source you're using, in terms of the author or an analyst, uh, per pound. Per pound? Yeah, yeah. For one pound of beef, yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah. 25, what would you say? 2,500. 2,500 gallons of water. Yeah, the cow is a very docile uh, animal, but they're a dictator in terms of how much uh, resources they require and use. And you go over to natural resources, things like drought in California, you know, it's becoming a subject. It's, who's using all the water, right? So here, here's a statement, and I think it's probably well understood, but if China does what we're doing with meat, we won't have a climate. Okay, that's a pretty dire statement. I'm gonna go to my happy place now. Okay. Every person on this planet needs to eat. Our entire civilization requires a regular supply of food to function. But what if the methods we use to make our burritos and sweet, sweet McNuggets are unsustainable and detrimental to our future well-being? We order something off the dollar menu? Maybe. Or we may have to change the means by which we produce our food. But most of all, we will have to change the way that we think about food. In this episode, we're going to look at the food of the future and see how we'll feed ourselves in a rapidly changing world. In my previous career, I used to work on trying to address the emissions uh, that come from transportation, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, but it slowly began to dawn on me uh, that automotive transportation and transportation in general was a very important contributor to, to greenhouse gas emissions. A far greater contributor is livestock. I happen to know a guy named Robert Goodland, who was a chief environmental officer at the World Bank. He retired and, and did an analysis around life cycle contribution of livestock to greenhouse gas emissions. Added them all up and came to a figure of 51%. He said 51% of greenhouse gas emissions are due to livestock. Goodland's estimate is controversial because his analysis includes factors that other reports don't. But the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimated that livestock contributes 18% of the total greenhouse gas emissions globally. Still, that's more than all trains, planes, and automobiles on the planet. Well, how? Because they're fighting so much? Well, yes, partly. The report took into account all aspects of the livestock's life cycle. That includes clearing land for pasture and crops for feeding the animals, chemical fertilizers for the plants, transportation and management of the animals, and yes, the methane the animals themselves produce. Farts. That all adds up to an enormous amount of greenhouse gases. The exact number varies from report to report. But it's a very big number. And that made a massive impression on me. And I began to focus on that and look at the incredible changes that come about if we just simply changed out the three to four ounces of uh, protein at the center of the plate. If we could shift that protein from being an animal source protein to a plant-based uh, protein, we could meet all of the greenhouse gas emission uh, protocols that have been put in place. So it's an incredible opportunity to, without much infrastructure change, uh, solve the climate problem. So we have to stop eating meat or the world will end. That's what I'm getting out of this. I think it's unrealistic to think that people are going to stop eating meat. So I think the, the, the question becomes, can you create meat directly from plants? Hasn't this been done before? I mean, we've got all kinds of fake meat. Yeah, but they're taking it a step further. They're trying to make a product directly from plants and make it indistinguishable from the real thing. Is that even possible? Beyond Meat will never be able to introduce pea protein powder into one end of a machine and extrude a convincing substitute for seared steak or roasted chicken from the other. So that appeared in a recent issue of Mother Jones and, and we obviously think it's completely wrong. I like that you, you, you made it big and put it up on yeah, the wall. Yeah, we're accepting the challenge. Yeah, cool. So uh, the first thing is, is finding the right uh, plant protein and then finding the plant protein that's been separated in a way that allows us to use it. So we start with yellow peas. Can I pick some of it up? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So it's a powder from yellow peas. Yeah. So we've simply taken the pea and through an aqueous-based process, separated out protein and fiber, yeah. uh, and then generating that powder, which is basically a very high concentration of, of protein. So this is essentially the same mix of plant-based materials, and we're adding it into this process that aligns the proteins in a way that's similar to their alignment in an animal's muscle. And it's basically heating, cooling, and pressure being applied to create that reorganization of the material so it takes on that fibrous texture of animal protein. I won't take you back there, but some of the fundamental science is occurring here. What kind of science goes into this? Like chemistry, botany? All of the above. All of, yeah. all of it. Yep. Every, everything from biochemistry through to food science uh, to culinary. It's a, a pretty big undertaking. We call this the Manhattan Beach Project <laughs> uh, because we're obviously close to Manhattan Beach. But more importantly, 
because we wanted to connote that sense of urgency as well as the sense that we're gathering some of the brightest scientists in the country mm -hmm. to work on what we feel is a global problem. Okay, so cows and chickens basically eat plants and convert that into meat. But Ethan Brown and company are taking the animals out of the equation and go straight to the plant. Sounds good. Problem solved, right? Not necessarily. We still got to get over the public's aversion to meat substitutes, which might be the biggest hurdle. Yeah, there are a couple of schools of thought. One is, you know, let's just try to shift people toward whole plant-based foods. The sort of Michael Pollan type, type analysis, right? Um, good luck with that. I have kids who are 9 and 10. After the softball game, baseball game, basketball game, their teams uh, are going to Chuck E. Cheese and, and Pizza Hut and uh, McDonald's. And we can't fight that fight and also try to have the scientific advancement we want. So our goal is to narrowly focus on simply replacing the amino acids, fats, minerals, so that they can continue to eat what they love, but they're using a plant-based source of meat. Why are people so attached to meat? It's just dead pieces of animal. Well, it tastes good. And a lot of fake meat has a bad rap. So it's almost like we have to trick people into eating this. Yeah, yeah, and we have tricked people um, in some <laughs> regards. This is Tim Geislinger, Vice President and Head of Research and Development. So the, the meat industry right now, is, uh, or the, the meat analog industry, is, is almost entirely composed of ready-to-eat products. So they're already cooked, you just kind of reheat them. People want to feel more, have a connection. There's a cultural component to cooking, right? There's people in the kitchen and cooking, there's all these things that are celebratory around that. Having something that's already kind of just cooked and you throw on the plate, that's fine in the presentation, but there's, there's so much more that goes into that experience. The key might be making a raw beef substitute that can cook just like real ground beef. Well, if you can make a fake burger in the same way that you make a real burger and it comes out looking and tasting like a real burger, who's to say what's real and what's not? Tasting is believing, right, Craig? That was clever. And so we believe that it'll fit into the mainstream a little more easily and that people will ultimately accept it. If it's, if it, but it has to taste good, it has to perform well, it's gotta be affordable, right? And it's gotta be healthy. Right. These are commercially available today. And this is called the Beast Burger. So this has all the protein and iron of raw ground beef, but it also has omegas, it has antioxidants, it has a, a muscle recovery blend that's made from different nutrients from plants. You're, you're, you're inventing meat, basically. Yeah, if, if you're gonna go to the trouble yeah. of, of redesigning it, so why not improve it a little bit? So did you get to try it? Yep, and because I'm such a science man, I brought in a control group of one, fellow YouTuber Jonah Green, just so you wouldn't think I was brainwashed by some sort of pea protein-based compliance serum. What? So, Jonah, have you ever eaten a burger before? Occasionally. You have? More than occasionally. Would you say you're a professional burger eater? I'd say I'm pretty close. I asked you to come here and eat um, with me. Yes. And why did you say yes? Because we're friends. We're best friends. We're best friends. We just met today. But we're, best I, we're in the same graduating yes, class, he's yes. lying. So what do you expect? What do you expect? Does this look good? What it actually, it does look really good. I've, yeah. um, I've never had a burger that's not a burger before. Yeah. So. Have you ever had like a, uh, like a vegan burger? No. No, you haven't. No, I haven't had anything that's not a beef burger before. So. Wow, true meat eater right here. It's me. I say we take a bite. All right, let's do I it. I want this. I want this. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Was there any doubt that I was going to like this? I mean, come on. It was really good. Mm -hmm. It was great. Mm -hmm. It was really good. Yeah, now I'm going to eat the whole thing. So what did it taste like, Craig? It tasted good, but it didn't taste exactly like a burger. But that's not necessarily what they're going for with the Beast Burger. They are working on a raw beef substitute that will more closely resemble beef in the future. I did get to try the chicken, however. Here, put a little put ketchup on or something. A little ketchup? Or whatever you want. I think I want to do it plain, plain first. Go ahead. I, want go ahead. To, I want to see how it tastes. Hey, can I get one of those? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Thanks, man. Easier to eat. That's what I'm here for. That's yeah. what they literally asked me to do. <laughs> they said, hey, come eat food. Hey, I'm going to try this fake chicken. Dude, what should I call it? Plant-based chicken. Plant-based chicken. So there's a, there's the striations. I can literally not tell the difference. Seriously, this is this, awesome. is this is exact. I I'm a skeptical guy, and I tell you. Yeah. Seriously. Wow. Yeah. That's that's almost better than chicken. That's that's really good. So it gives you a number of shoes on it before. Mm-hmm. Integrates. You guys gotta try this. This tastes no, like it's totally like chicken. It's what do you think? It's really good. Yeah. Can no, you I tell the difference? No. <laughs> I, if someone handed this to me and it's said better. it was chicken, I, I think it's better. Know. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Oh, it's really good. I want to take that sign you have out there and like tear it down. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Burn it. Seriously. Burn it I'm, ha yeah. I'm having another one. Yeah. <laughs>
You know, I think the future is going to be um, about consumers being able to buy protein, not meat and meat alternatives. And so I think if you walk into a supermarket 10 or 15 years from now, you'll see a protein section, not a meat counter. And there'll be products like ours where it's meat made from plants and the sources of protein will be things like lentil, peas, camelina, lupin, soy, all these different sources. And then next it'll be the animal protein equivalent. In this episode, we're going to go on a journey through time and taste and explore how we may grow our food and what we might be eating in the future. In our next video, we'll look at one of the most plentiful sources of meat on our planet, bugs. Then we'll turn our attention to plants and go inside the farm of the future. And finally, we'll visit with Ken Dunn and learn how to turn our cities into gardens. But first, what do you guys think? Should we cut down on our meat consumption? And if so, is creating a convincing substitute for things like hamburger and steak the way to do it? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And you can go to our Patreon page if you want to support the show. Now we're going to answer some questions from our previous playlist, Seeing Isn't Believing. Okay? All right. Let's Sounds good to me. Let's do it. So on our Limits of Perception video, a number of you asked if people who had ADD or ADHD would be affected by the gorilla experiment. Well, we emailed Dan Simons, the guy that we interviewed, and he said that there weren't very many studies about that, but we shouldn't expect much difference between people with ADHD or not, because if you're not focused on the primary activity, in this case, the bouncing of the balls, then anybody would notice the gorilla, ADHD or not. Groombot2 asked about Stephen Wiltshire. Stephen Wiltshire is the guy who can make insanely detailed drawings of places he's been uh, just from memory. We asked Dan Simons about this too, and he said that Stephen Wiltshire can't be taking a photograph of the scene, but what he must be doing is uh, looking around, glancing the scene, scanning around, and taking all that together and forming a single picture. Now, most people can't retain all that information, but Stephen Wiltshire must have just a really, really good memory. Geo Jake commented on Are We Alone in the Universe and wondered why no one seems to consider the possibility that interstellar travel might be impossible. Is it physically impossible? Even at the slow pace of the Voyager spacecraft, an alien race could colonize some portion of the galaxy at a time scale less than the age of the universe. Now, would the alien civilization survive long enough? Maybe not. That's a different question. But it is also possible that aliens are just homebodies and they don't want to leave their planet. And it would be really, really hard to travel far into the universe. Cut the aliens some slack, guys. Just... It's possible. In the Is the Universe a Hologram video, a couple of you asked about the holographic principle and how it affects the universe having an edge or not. There's an old Hank Green mantra, no edge, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Well, he himself in a video has said that we're not even sure if the universe has an edge or not. And the holographic principle isn't implying that there's an edge. Susskind says there's a horizon, which is basically as far as we'll ever be able to see. What's interesting about the holographic principle, though, is that it literally applies to any 2D surface surrounding a 3D volume. Physicists have discovered that mathematically, the information contained in a 3D volume is directly proportional to the 2D surface. This is a little hard to follow, and it has a lot to do with string theory. I recommend going to read Susskind's book, The Black Hole War, if you want to learn more. In our next video, we're going to respond to comments from this very video, so leave your questions. Make it good. Or not, whatever, no pressure.